Well, reception to my last video was considerably greater than I anticipated, so thank you. If you haven't checked that out, I highly recommend you do so before watching this video since you'll find some of the ideas introduced there are further explained here. You'll find a link in the description. It's winter here on the farm and things have definitely slowed down. As you can see, we're clearing out the greenhouse of all the fig leaves that have fallen and doing some routine winter maintenance. Our fig trees, because they're such vigorous plants, are pruned to a Japanese step over espalier form to allow us to maintain them at a workable but productive size and to make harvest easier. Easier. Over the years, they've continued to grow and grow such that we're removing every other tree to allow them to further stretch their limbs to try to tame some of that vigor. Anyways, you probably didn't click on this to hear about figs, so let's move on. As a follow-up to our last video, I wanted to do a slightly deeper dive into a few topics that are of interest to me and hopefully you as well. In talking with folks over the years about climate batteries, I've come across a number of repeated misconceptions. We could call them myths too because that sounds more provocative and attention-grabbing, but misconceptions is probably the better word. I've written an article on our website at atmosgreenhouse.com if you'd like to read through and do a deeper dive, though you'll find the points here a bit rearranged for the sake of the video. And the tricky part about these misconceptions is that there's often a grain or more than a grain of truth hidden inside. So as I discuss these, I'll try to do my best to address the misconception and its roots, as well as hopefully provide some clarity as to a better way to think about it. Now, I shared many, if not all, of these misconceptions at one time, so I certainly hope you'll listen with an open mind. And why do these misconceptions matter? Because in many instances, they provide a basis for understanding of a climate battery's job and how it functions. So a misunderstanding here can lead to a poor climate battery decisions or poor operating decisions as a result, something I'd like for you to avoid. So let's dive in. Misconception number one, the soil is a constant temperature X feet underground. You may have heard something along these lines, that X feet underground, and by X they usually mean around three feet or below, the temperature of the earth is a constant Y degrees. In a qualified sense, that's true. The temperature of the earth does become more constant the deeper you go, However, it still swings seasonally to much greater depths than you might imagine. As demonstrated by the graphic from a project done at the University of Virginia, the temperature of the Earth varies seasonally and in a time-delayed way. So as you might expect, the soil surface temperature has the wildest swings, and it reaches its peak at midsummer and its low at midwinter, while the temperature even down to a depth of 12 feet swings seasonally. In fact, it's not till about 20 to 24 feet below the surface that these seasonal variations in temperature level out, as we see on this graphic. Fun fact, and something potentially useful for climate batteries, the near constant temperature at these lower depths is actually close to the average of the year-round temperature. Therefore, as you go further south in the U.S., it gets warmer, and the further north, it gets colder. So in a qualified sense, this misconception is true, but only at much lower depths than most folks imagine. Misconception number two, a climate battery lets you tap into an unlimited heating source, the Earth. So misconception number one often leads to a false conclusion that because the temperature of the earth is constant at X feet below ground, putting in a climate battery will allow me to tap into limitless constant heat. So if, for example, in Pennsylvania where we're located, the earth is close to 50 degrees Fahrenheit at lower depths. Therefore, the logic says that when we're heating our structure, we'd have a close to unlimited supply of nearly 50 degree air. However, this view gets two connected items wrong. First, it presumes that the Earth's heat can move rapidly enough through the soil to replenish any heat that was extracted from the soil surrounding the climate battery tubing. Heat moves very slowly through the soil profile as demonstrated in the time-delayed soil temperature study where it peaks in temperature at the surface mid-summer and doesn't peak at the 12-foot depth until nearly mid-fall. So that means it takes over two months then for that soil surface heat to make its way to a 12-foot depth. As I said, heat moves very slowly through soil. If we're constantly drawing on a climate battery through the winter season, the natural temperature conduction that happens in the soil can't replenish at the rate it's being extracted. Note that I'm not saying that the earth doesn't replenish some of the heat within the climate battery. In fact, we do benefit from what I call temperature buffering in the winter when we go through a cool but cloudy stretch where the climate battery doesn't run in heating or cooling mode. If we've previously drawn a lot of heat from the climate battery, such that the climate battery's soil is colder than the surrounding soil, we do see the temperature begin to creep up very slowly of, over the course of, say, a week. The second item it gets wrong is it ignores the battery part of climate battery, meaning that the thermal mass we're tapping into is charged and discharged similar to an electrical battery. Speaking from personal experience, we can easily overdraw on this battery when the available charge, the sun, is at its weakest in the winter. Managing a climate battery in the winter is a bit like the expression, one step forward, two steps back. We get a little bit of solar gain through a sunny winter day and are able to capture some of that excess heat, so one step forward, but then our heating demand at night far exceeds any gain during the day, two steps back. 
Therefore, we're very conservative with drawing on heat during the winter in our particular climate, given that we don't really have any significant backup heat. We don't want to reach the point where the soil has very little heat energy to provide back into the structure. So the surrounding soil can help us out, but the heat we're drawing on certainly isn't functionally limitless. Misconception number three, a climate battery is sufficient to provide cooling during the summer months. Speaking of treating the climate battery as a battery, that leads us to misconception number three that a climate battery can help us with cooling during the summer months. It is true that a climate battery helps us with cooling our greenhouses, and that has a double benefit of preheating the root zone soil. So when we're getting late into winter, our goal is to dump as much heat as possible into the soil as quickly as possible to begin to spin that thermal flywheel as we approach spring. With a warm root zone and warm air temperatures, our plants wake up earlier and are happier, and our growing season is extended into months like March and April, when the sun is strong, but the outside weather just hasn't caught up. During this late winter and early spring season, we're trying to increase our soil temperatures as quickly as possible into the mid 60s or 70s. That means as the soil temperature rises, our ability to push heat into the soil diminishes. Since the rate of heat transfer increases as the difference between the air and the soil temperature increases, we can move heat into the soil at a greater rate when the soil's in the 40s than when the soil's in the upper 60s to 70s. Maybe you see where I'm going here. As we get further and further into the spring, uh, we have two problems. The soil is already warm, so we can't push heat at the same rate we could a month before. And compounding this, the sun gets stronger and stronger as we approach the summer solstice. So at some point, the ground effectively ceases to be an excellent heat sink. And unless we want to bake our plants, that heat has to go somewhere. There's a key point in the year when the climate battery alone isn't sufficient for cooling. Our soil is warm enough to provide for any heating needs, and we need to begin venting our greenhouse through operating doors, rolling up sidewalls, and operating our end wall peak vents. So past a certain point in the spring, and certainly through the summer, the climate battery alone isn't sufficient for cooling. Misconceptions number four and number five. Pipe length should be between 25 to 35 feet, and airspeed must be slow to allow time for heat transfer. I've decided to lump two misconceptions together because they're related. A fourth misconception goes like this. When designing a climate battery, the tubing lengths should be 25 to 35 feet long or thereabouts. This is often paired with the misconception number five, the thought that the airspeed must be relatively slow to allow time for heat transfer. Okay, this is gonna get technical and nerdy for a minute or two, bear with me. All materials, including soil, have a measured rate at which they can accept heat called their thermal conductivity. Therefore, part of our job in designing a good climate climate battery is to build it in such a way that we maximize the rate at which heat is transferred into the soil by the system. Studies done on climate batteries, backed up by our experience and study, show that as velocity in the piping increases, so does the rate at which heat is transferred into the soil to a point. So higher velocity is better to a point. At some point, it becomes too expensive to push air around at ever-increasing velocities through the fans that we choose. So there's likely a point of diminishing returns in terms of the rate of heat transferred into and out of the soil versus the energy spent in running the fans to store and extract that heat. In one study that we reference, a velocity range of 4.5 to 9 meters per second, or around 15 to 30 feet per second, was selected as a good balance between the rate of heat transfer into the soil and the energy spent running the fans to facilitate that heat transfer. And yes, before we get any comments on this, we are conveniently ignoring for now the heat of phase change that can happen when warm, humid air hits cold soil and condensation drops out. That's fairly technical, but the TLDR conclusion seems to point to velocity being the key driver of the rate at which you can store and extract heat rather than a particular tubing length. This misconception led us to some poor choices with our first two greenhouses that I would love for folks to avoid, so learn from our mistakes. And let me be perfectly honest and candid here. This is one of the key areas of study that we need to pursue even further. If we could do calculations or multi-physics simulations with CFD and heat transfer, along with validation through sensors in the greenhouse, I think that would greatly greatly aid in developing a more complete picture to help design better climate batteries. If that's something you're interested in or have ideas on, please reach out to me through our website or in the comments to this video. To this point, commercial CFD and multi-physics software has been out of reach for us due to the high costs and my background is not in CAD modeling. Again, if you stuck with me for this long, thank you. My intent here wasn't to shame anyone for any of these misconceptions, but instead to hopefully provide some clarity where understanding seemed cloudy. And as always, we recommend checking out climate battery resources at our website threefold.farm and information at our climate battery company atmosgreenhouse.com. God bless and thanks y'all.